Should objects have rights? Is a question I eternally ask myself when looking at robots like 2B and 9S, Androids 18 and 21, Haiti, Dorothy from Big O, Genos from One Punch Man, GLaDOS, XJ9, Roxanne from Five Nights at Freddy's, Eve from WALL-E, and the Brave Little Toaster. My penis doesn't have rights. But thanks to those robots, it technically avoids committing all sorts of human rights violations thanks to this loophole in legal sentience definitions about three or four times a week depending on how tired I am from making content all day. So what, if anything, should we guarantee to artificially intelligent brethren when the world inevitably decides that pictures of literal weapons, maids, and transportation vehicles grafted with human skin isn't enough to get our engines running and we need to finally make real waifus that can drink motor oil and crush obsidian with their bare hands? They don't need food. They don't need water. They probably don't even understand the concept of breathing. What they do need is legal representation. There's an official lawyer type term for when you sue a thing called in rem jurisdiction, which when translated from Latin means, if I can't have sex with that rock, I will sue it into the ground. There's a ton of legalese surrounding this term and a long Wikipedia page explanation that I'm too lazy to read because the specifics aren't important. It just means that when filing a lawsuit against somebody, you can choose instead to sue a piece of property or title that's in the person's possession. In other words, you can legally sue inanimate objects, and that to me is funny as shit. So let's read some notable examples. Keep in mind, I'm not a lawyer, and I'm trying my absolute best to understand how these trials went with my 7th grade reading comprehension. So if I fudge some details, please forgive me, and then go fuck yourself. This is entertainment, not a law school. If you want to pay me a $60,000 per year tuition, then I'll start doing some comprehensive fact-checking. United States versus 40 barrels and 20 kegs of Coca-Cola. In 1906, people had grown tired of eating rocks, drinking fish parts, and sleeping on mattresses made of iron rebar and stillborn children. So they thought, hey, at least we can do something about the geodes and mermaid paste. Enter the Pure Food and Drug Act, a precursor to food safety regulations such as the Food and Drug Administration, the People for No Trouble Eating and Drinking Initiative, and the Rumbly Tummy Brigade. In a piece of internet trivia sent to you by your grandma with like 10 shocked emojis, Coca-Cola's primary ingredients used to include cocaine. By 1903, Coca-Cola, due to everyone suddenly becoming lame and wanting a more boring, unfulfilling life, began to use spent, low-potency cocoa leaves in their product, severely reducing the amount of cocaine in the drink. To compensate, they increased the amount of caffeine. Dr. Harvey Washington Wiley, when not spending most of his time using his eight robot masters to stop Mega Man, thought that any consumption of caffeine was harmful to humans. And so, after sleeping a full eight hours and presumably suffering no anxiety whatsoever, he commanded that 40 barrels and 20 kegs containing the crazy caffeinated Coca-Cola be confiscated and classified. On March 13, 1911, from then on known as Pepsi-Cola Wins Fatality Day, the government sued Coca-Cola to get them to remove caffeine from their tooth-destroying soda pop. One of the claims made in the case was that the cola in question contained a harmful amount of caffeine, about 78.4 milligrams per 8-ounce serving. Wow. 78.4 milligrams of caffeine per 8 ounces. That is an unfathomable amount. I highly doubt the human body could ever survive that. I mean, coffee, a beverage that we've been drinking since about the 15th century, only contains about 95 milligrams of caffeine per 8-ounce serving. Good on the government for stepping in and telling Coke, hey buddy, rein it in a little, you're getting a little ridiculous. The government ruled in favor of the 40 barrels and 20 kegs of Coke, claiming that overall, Coca-Cola is more of a brand name than a statement of ingredients, and that Coke can put pretty much anything they want in their drink as long as it's not directly harmful to people. Basically, cocaine, too much. Caffeine, that's eh, fine, I guess. And to give Dr. Wiley a mega buster shaped middle finger, the Coca-Cola company decided to reduce the caffeine in their drink anyway to prevent any future lawsuits. 
And now, thanks to this decision, you're unfortunately a bit starved for options if you're looking for a highly caffeinated drink in the modern world. You're pretty much stuck with Red Bull, G Fuel, Bang, Rockstar, Rain, NOS, Kickstart, Amp, 5 Hour Energy, Balls, <laughs> C4, Ghost, Vault, Cocaine, both the drink and the substance, Jolt Cola, Pussy, Red Rooster, Beaver Buzz, Coca-Cola Energy Drink, BPM, Burn, Gladiator, Mother from Nintendo, Real Gold, Scorpion, Ultra Energy, Urge, Full Throttle, and of course Monster. Hey, wait a minute, those last 12 entries are owned by the Coca motherfucking Cola Company. United States versus one book called Ulysses. Fuck this book in particular. That's the idea behind this particular court case. Ulysses isn't just the name of a Civil War general who said, fuck it, I guess I'll be the president now. It's also the title of a James Joyce novel that absolutely no human on Earth has ever read. Don't you dare put in the comments that you've read it before, I'll know you're lying. Ulysses is long as hell, and was initially published in a literary magazine in episodes. There's a particular episode titled Scratching That Itch, which contains descriptions of a character masturbating. And because some people just want to ruin absolutely everything and don't know how to deal with the fact that no one likes them, a random woman complained that this was obscene and got the book banned from publishing for over a decade. Random House, the publishing company behind Ulysses, came up with a plan. They would import the French version of the book to America and tell the U.S. Customs Office, we're importing our banned book to America. You can't stop us. Here's the ship it'll be on, and here's all the mailing information. What are you going to do about it? Confiscate the book? Oh boy, bet you're a big man. A big fucking man, huh? Confiscating our banned book? God, we're so fucking horny. Do whatever you want, just don't confiscate our banned book. Random House planned for the book to be confiscated under the Tariff Act of 1930, which allowed the government to seize and destroy any imported materials considered of an obscene nature. If the book was legally ordered to be confiscated, then Random House could fight the fact it was claimed obscene in court, and if they won the case, the book's ban would be lifted and the work would no longer be considered obscene, taking credibility from the reason it was banned in the first place. This is some real heist movie shit. All according to Keikaku stuff. Except there was one small problem. The US Customs initially didn't give a shit. Despite being explicitly told that a banned book was being imported, they didn't do a goddamn thing about it. And the book was safely delivered from France to Random House's doorstep. Random House's attorney, presumably while screaming, Fuck, 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 what do I do? Ah, shit, fuck me! Took the imported book directly to the US Customs office and demanded that the book be seized. So the custom shrugged, seized the book, and the trial could start. And everyone was happy, especially Random House, because they were able to convince the court that Ulysses is not an obscene work. This trial established the precedent that context and the entire work as a whole matter when deciding whether or not a work should be censored in distribution. It also established that judging whether or not a work should be circulated should be left up to someone with average judgment, rather than someone who's easily sensitive or offended. Meaning that to this day, no one is allowed to judge works for censorship if they've ever posted on Resetera. United States versus one package of Japanese pessaries. Speaking of me overusing the word obscene, a doctor was also sued for violating the Tariff Act of 1930. And what was the obscene thing she imported? Why a golden metal rod you jam up your pussy, of course. Dr. Hannah Stone imported a Japanese pessary for a patient, which looks like this. Boy, am I glad I don't have a vagina, because I'd prefer to not have that stuffed up there. The government lost the lawsuit, by the way, because playing with your genitals is socially acceptable if done for medical reasons. United States versus 11 and a quarter dozen packages of articles labeled in part Miss Moffitt's Shoe Fly Powders for Drunkenness. 
Miss Moffat's Shoe Fly Powders for Drunkenness, full name Miss Moffat's Shoe Fly Powders the Great Liquor Antidote for Drunkenness, and commonly known as Miss Moffat's Powders containing presumably no fly parts, but acting as a pseudo treatment for drunkenness by inducing the act of vomiting, which may in some cases cause your symptoms to lessen, for short, was just powdered antimony potassium tartarate, which would cause you to violently vomit and not much else. The government ruled that this product didn't exactly cure drunkenness as much as it did force you to toss your cookies. So the boxes were seized and destroyed. United States versus one solid gold object in the form of a rooster. Dick Graves was the owner of the Sparks Nugget Casino. Now stick with me here, I swear these aren't just names of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure characters. Dick decided he wanted to make a solid gold rooster statue to showcase in the restaurant of his casino. He claimed it was to entice people to eat there. But we all know it was just because Dick really wanted to show off his cock. He made a wooden cock first and telephoned the U.S. Mint in Washington, D.C. and said, Hey guys, my cock is really great, but I'd love to have a solid gold cock. You know what I'm saying? The U.S. Mint cited the Gold Reserve Act and said no one man should have all that power. His request was denied. Dick wasn't a pussy, so instead he moved to California and contracted the San Francisco Mint to build the statue. And they, being a city known to excel in dick riding, made a golden cock. Two years later, the Secret Service thought about this whole thing, realized a cock was nothing to play around with, and raided the casino to steal the bird that they had been flipped. Long story short, lawyers successfully argued that the statue was commissioned as an art piece and not as a way to hoard gold. And so the dragon Smaug, excuse me, the real life video game character Dick Graves was able to show off his obvious penis joke until the end of time. United States versus article consisting of 50,000 cardboard boxes, more or less, each containing one pair of clacker balls. The U.S. government seized about 50,000 sets of clacker balls, JoJo's reference number two here, under the Federal Hazardous Substance Act, because they claimed that children could hit themselves with the balls, and they were therefore dangerous. Following this decision, the government decided to double down on their anti-child self-harm policies and confiscated every single handheld object ever made. United States versus one lucite ball containing lunar material, one moon rock, and one 10-inch by 14-inch wooden plaque. In 1973, President Nixon gave the country of Honduras a plaque containing some moon rocks as a gesture of goodwill. He did this without asking any citizens of the moon for permission, but we'll let that slide. Sometime around 1994, retired Honduran colonel whose name I'm about to butcher, Roberto Aguercia Ugarte, somehow illegally acquired the moon rocks into his personal possession. Instead of doing the civilized thing of crushing them up and snorting them, he sold the plaque with the moon rocks to a fruit distributor from Florida named Alan Rosen. NASA, understandably, was fucking pissed. They didn't go through all that trouble of faking the moon landing to sell moon rocks at premium prices just to have people undercutting their profits on the side. In 1998, NASA joined up with the U.S. Postal Inspection Service to launch a sting operation called Operation Lunar Eclipse. They placed an ad in the paper titled Moon Rocks Wanted, which read, Do you happen to have moon rocks you want to sell? Are you a fruit distributor? Is your name Alan Rosen? Then boy, would we love to talk to you. U.S. Customs agents were dispatched to meet with Rosen in a Miami restaurant where they promptly seized the moon rocks on the premise that they had been illegally imported into the United States, which is super bullshit and ironic as far as the moon is concerned. United States versus approximately 64,695 pounds of shark fins. Now I know what you're thinking, but this case title isn't just because Americans finally caught on to how delicious shark fin soup is and decided to hoard it all for themselves. In 2002, a Coast Guard crew stopped and searched a ship from Hong Kong called the King Diamond II that was bearing a U.S. flag and therefore operated as a ship owned by the United States. The Coast Guard found the ship to be carrying about 32.3 tons of shark fins without a single shark corpse on board. After reading their What I Did Over Summer Vacation book report, the Coast Guard determined the boat was meeting other boats in international waters and buying shark fins off of them. 
the Coast Guard, needing a good excuse to cover up the fact they themselves had recently gotten shark fin soup fever and wanted to hoard all the fins for themselves, sued the boat under the Shark Finning Prohibition Act of 2000, which prevented any U.S.-aligned fishing ships from harvesting shark fins. The Coast Guard won the trial, and the shark fins were seized by the government. But then, the King Diamond II unveiled its trap card, activated its Kaioken, revealed its stand, unleashed Hokuto Shinken, and then finally reversed the court's decisions and appeals. The King Diamond II argued that technically they hadn't broken any laws, since the boat's activities meant it technically wasn't a fishing ship, it was just a fish part buying and selling ship. It was a machine filling the orders of other fishing boats, rather than a machine rinsing out the ocean's resources, which is pretty obvious to understand. Therefore, the U.S. couldn't legally seize the shark fins. In 2011, personal friend of mine Barack Obama signed in the Shark Conservation Act, which prevented this silly shit from ever happening again. And so, no sharks have ever been harvested for their fins since, because no one ever breaks the law. South Dakota versus 15 impounded cats. We've all had our routine traffic stops. We've all practiced our best excuses to get out of them, and we've all been let go with a warning every single time because of our light skin color. But what if your excuse for a traffic violation was, I'm sorry, officer, I couldn't see you because my rear view was blocked by the 15 feral cats I keep locked in my car. A South Dakota woman did just that, and the police officer impounded her cat, citing poor sanitary conditions in the car, including a full litter box and a strong pet odor. Most cat odors can contest that a full litter box and a strong pet owner are very unusual things to find somewhere where cats might be residing. But then again, knowing cat people, those things could have been originating from the cat owner themselves. There was some arguing back and forth, but overall the seizure was found lawful on the grounds that the conditions not only posed a health risk to the cats, but that the distraction they caused residing inside the vehicle was a danger to pedestrians. When asked to comment on the issue, Dick Graves said, quote, And that's why I don't work with pussies. United States versus one Tyrannosaurus Batar skeleton. It's just a case of a guy trying to illegally sell a dinosaur skeleton by changing its country of origin and it's fucking boring because I thought it was going to be the government trying to fight or sue an actual dinosaur with his tiny little ill-fitting suit and his little T-Rex hands and, you know, it's an ability to read, but it's just a paint by number smuggling case. It fucking sucks. Let's just move on. And finally... United States of America versus approximately 450 ancient cuneiform tablets and approximately 3,000 ancient clay bouillé, otherwise known as the Hobby Lobby smuggling scandal. I'm just going to quote Wikipedia on this one. In December 2010, Hobby Lobby purchased $1.6 million worth of Iraqi artifacts from dealers in the United Arab Emirates. Let me read that again. In December 2010, Hobby Lobby purchased $1.6 million worth of Iraqi artifacts from dealers in the United Arab Emirates. Because the artifacts were poorly documented and very likely to have been stolen and purchased off the black market, U.S. Customs seized the shipments and ordered Hobby Lobby to return 5,500 other artifacts. They also forced them to pay a fine of $3 million. Allegedly, this was all thanks to the Green family, an evangelical Christian family who owns the Museum of the Bible, a Washington, D.C. museum dedicated to historical artifacts of biblical significance. The Green family also happens to own Hobby Lobby. So now, not only does this all make sense, but now when you're walking down the aisles of your favorite crafting store, it's not going to be too surprising when you see the Shroud of Turin next to the glitter in Crazy Glue. There's other examples of in-rem jurisdiction, but those are the ones I found the most interesting. Join me next time when I cover times people have sued each other for thoughts they've had, times they've sneezed too hard, and times they've already sued each other.